Okay, our special guest tonight is a gentleman by the name of David John. Um, David is an exercise physiologist, um, very experienced in cricket, a level three cricket coach, and a former assistant coach of the Western Australian Cricket Association. Um, David was involved in the fast bowling program back in the 80s and 90s, uh, in which uh, Western Australia was probably a, a pioneer. Um, those parents here who know Western Australia or know state cricket will know the uh, great fast bowlers that uh, Western Australian cricket has produced. And David was a part of that uh, program coming through. So, exceptional cricket knowledge. Um, also, a former, uh, what could you say, assistant coach of the Indian hockey side that uh, played the London Olympics, computer analyst for them, manager of an Indian hockey league side currently. Um, and also doing a lot of work in New South Wales and Australian hockey programs. So he's multi-sport talented, um, but his love, his passion, I know is cricket. Um, whenever we get together, watching our girls play hockey together, all we talk about is cricket. So he's got a thirst for cricket. He loves coming around. He's, he's looking to get involved in our club, and we're hoping to have him sort of come in over the next few months. So David's knowledge, his first class on athlete development right the way through, from physically, uh, mentally and socially, so he's going to present to us. We've had a little hiccup, our club secretary has taken the data projector, so David's going to work on the whiteboard off his computer here, so bear with him. Um, and again, at the end, we'll have a bit of a question and answer for David. So thank you very much for joining us, mate, and good luck. The floor's yours. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, I played a little bit of great cricket, uh, and the club captain of my team was Kim Hughes at the time. Terry Alderman played in the team, Tom Hogan played in the team. Uh, I didn't play in that team, I played in second grade, but we had quality Australian players playing club cricket in those days, I'm talking the 1980s. Um, when I went to university, we had the state coach, who was one of my lecturers, his name was Darrell Foster. And uh, Darrell was one of the pioneers in trying to determine what caused fast bowling injuries. Because as at the time he was coaching West Australia, Dennis Lee was one of his bowlers and he broke down in the West Indies and came back and said to Darrell, look, I have to change my action in some way and I don't want to break down again because it's going to interfere with my career. Um, can you spend the time to look at my action and look at what's causing the problem? I happened to be sort of at the time looking to do a research project and Darrell said, would you like to get involved in this? And I spent the next two years looking at not elite fast bowlers, but actually 12 to 19 year olds. So you fit into that category. And we looked at three different things. One was the action, okay. one was the workload, and one was the physical makeup of those players. And what was, what was actually causing the problem? Was it a combination of all three, or was it just one thing in particular? So for the fast bowlers in here, um, I suppose I coined the, the term a mix action in those days where most of my group, and there were 90 young fast bowlers aged between 12 and 19 in my subject group, the ones that broke down I had what's called a mix action. Okay. Which means they were not completely side on, not completely front on, but bowled with a combination of the two. And that combined with an overload or bowling too much generally caused a back injury. Once I'd finished my research, uh, someone else came along in my position and carried on the research. And his, his next phase was to look at a younger age group, 8 through to 15, to see when does the damage actually start occurring. And frighteningly, he did MRIs and bone scans on these 8 to 15 year olds. And frighteningly, he found that a lot of those young fast bowlers under the age of 10 were already showing damage in their discs and in their vertebra. You have to understand, boys, that your discs and your vertebra at your age is quite soft, it's like a piece of cheese. Okay, so it's relatively easy to fracture. It actually doesn't get, the spine doesn't stop growing until you have to get to 24 or 25. Right, so Pattinson and Cummins and players like this, that's why they keep breaking down with stress fractures because their bones actually haven't stopped growing yet, they're still soft. So if you put too much stress on those soft bones, obviously the bones will break. Right. 
Then we had a number of players come to us in West Australia because we developed a reputation um, at looking at actions and trying to mould actions. Uh, we had a number of players come to us and say, can you actually repair our action? Some of you might remember a guy called Dennis Hickey. At the time, he was the fastest white man in the world. He was a Victorian fast bowler, but he kept breaking down. So he shifted across to Perth for 12 months to try and fix his action. And he spent four to five days a week, two to three hours a day with us, trying to remodel his action. And he could get up to about 80% of his maximum pace. And he was perfect. But as soon as he bowled at maximum pace, he would relapse back into his old action, and that caused him to break down again. So we went back and looked at young fast bowlers again, this age group, to look at how hard is it to remodel an action after a certain age. Right. And we found that after the age of 12, it was very, very difficult for you to change your action. You'd basically patterned your brain, you'd instructed your brain to bowl in a certain way, and that pattern was very difficult to change after the age of 12. All right. So young, young coaches here, you have a responsibility to actually teach the right action at a young age. Otherwise, once Graham gets them at 16, 18, 20, he can testify it's very difficult to change and modify. You can tinker with, but it's very difficult to change the action and remodel it completely. And hence, patents and Cummins are still breaking down. And they work full time on changing their actions. All right. So in terms of fast bowling, bowling with the correct action is really important. So that got me involved in cricket. <coughs> I then uh, became an assistant coach with the West Australian team, looking after the bowlers and all the rehab. And we went through and we beat New South Wales about four times in the Shield Finals, I think. But at the time, I think, uh, we, in those seven years I was there, we won seven titles and New South Wales won seven. But we never won the One Day and the Shield in the same year. We would always alternate. Right? But we both had very strong teams at the time. Um, I then went back to eventually uh, club coaching. Yeah, so I, a bit like the Campbelltown Club here, I coached a, a team in West Australia called Jude Club, um, and went back to working at grassroots level knowing that it's very important to work with this age group to develop good habits at a young age so that we can then develop future shield players, international players. The landscape of cricket has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. You can make a substantial, well, more than a substantial living out of cricket nowadays. We couldn't, right? Um, we've paid basically for the love of the game. Nowadays, shield cricketers, IPL cricketers are making millions of dollars. So there's a great pathway for you to follow and move through, if you're good enough. Um, parents, how many of you are in Supercoach? Did you do a Supercoach scenario with rugby or AFL? Do you understand what Supercoach is, guys? Right. Supercoach means you get the chance to pick your own group of players, your own team, and play with that team over a year. Okay? It's, a fantasy, it's like fantasy football. I have that opportunity to do this in India. So I don't do it with cricket, I do it with hockey. So in cricket, there's IPL in India, there's also an IPL for hockey. And I have the opportunity to go up there to an auction and buy my team. So before I go, I have a strategy about the type of player I'm looking for to buy. Okay? And I have a whole category, a list of different categories as to the type of players I'm looking for. Right. But number one in the category is attitude. It comes before skill, technique. Right. I look at attitude first. Right. And I've known so many players from so many different sports over the years that have unlimited potential, okay, who never make it. Particularly at under 19 level. They make Australian under 19 cricket sides and are never heard of again after that age group. Because they have a lot of talent and they've picked because of their talent, but they have a poor attitude. And eventually that poor attitude catches up with them. And my best example was Damien Martin. He got made the West Australian captain Stupidly, I think, at age 21, right? 
he was playing with the likes of older players like Tom Moody, um, Justin Langer. Tom Moody probably should have been made the captain, and they made Damien the captain. From that point on, his attitude changed. Right. He no longer had the work ethic that he had before he was 21. Uh, he suddenly ha had to have a media presence, okay, and it changed his focus. Now, you're probably too young to follow the career of Damien Martin, but by 23, he got dropped from the West Australian side. He played for Australia at that stage, okay, was an up-and-comer, uh, a bit like Ricky Ponting. You know, it was the, ne the next great batsman coming through, and by 23, he'd been dropped from West Australia. Australia had dropped him, West Australia dropped him, he was back playing club cricket for Wanneroo. And at that point, he came and saw me. Right. And he said, would you help me to make a change? And I said, yes, but only if you make a change to this. Okay. You have to change your attitude. You still have the skill, you haven't lost that. You still have the ability, you haven't lost that. What you've lost over the last three years is your attitude. All right, so boys, this is very, very important. And what I mean by attitude, first of all, it's a training ethic. Okay? So you come to training with a purpose and a goal, you listen to what your coach requires of you, and you carry out that training as best as you can. You work well with your teammates. Cricket's a funny sport because I think it's a group of 11 individuals that play as a team, often. Yes, you play in partnerships when you're back together, but often it's quite a selfish sport, but it's still a team sport. So you have to get on with your teammates and play well with your teammates. And I look at that when I'm selecting my hockey team, I'm looking at the type of personality right, that each player brings to that team. Even, at, even in, at your age group, we're looking for your desire to get better. How much do you want to improve? Are you the type of person that thinks, I already know it all? Okay. Or you, with each training session you go to, are you trying to work on a particular area of your game to improve your game? Okay. Your coach is probably best to answer that, or your parents. But as an outsider, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking at attitude. And as you get older, it's going to get more difficult to make those state teams. All right, suddenly, the New South Wales team, there's only 11 picked. Right? And to make a difference and make that team, you have to do the little 5 percenters, I call it. It's not 1 percenters, it's 5 percenters. You have to do the little bit extra Right, to make sure that you're noticed by the select state selectors. Okay, you're putting your hand up by doing all the little things. And we're going to talk about some of those little things today. One of them is nutrition. Obviously, the second thing I'm going to be looking for is that you have skill. Most of your motor skills have already been developed. They were developed by age eight or nine. Okay, eight or nine. All you're doing now is you're refining these skills. Right? You're making them better. So within this group, someone's already identified that you have particular skills to succeed at either bowling, batting, or wicket keeping. Okay? And what we're trying to do now, through good training and a good attitude, is refine those skills to make them better and better. So I don't have to talk about skill, because I'm assuming you all have it. The next thing that makes a good, I think, a good athlete, you have to have some athletic ability. But more importantly, you have to have good, what I call, mechanics. So, I'm what's called a biomechanist. I'm an exercise physiologist, but I'm also a biomechanist. A biomechanist looks at your mechanics. The way you walk, 
the way you run, obviously the way you bowl, I'm an expert at that. Okay? Others will be an expert at the way you bat and the way you throw. Right. So to make it, you need some athletic ability, but it's not the most important criteria, particularly in cricket. Not all great athletes make great cricketers. And certainly not all great cricketers are very good athletes. Did you train with the Wars, Steve? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Uh, they weren't great trainers. Right, they hardly trained at all. You didn't see them train? No. <laughs> no. They didn't like training. Right? But they made great cricketers. Right? So they had good skill and they had some athletic ability, but they didn't always put it to their best use. Right? They had good mechanics. So biomechanics, I mean your walking style, the way you walk, the way you run, and certainly the way you bowl if you're a bowler. You have to have good mechanics to prevent injury. That's very important. Particularly at your ages now, because once you've been selected in this particular group, right, suddenly your workload's increased. You're no longer training Tuesday and Thursday and playing a game on the weekend. I assume now there's one extra training session. Yeah? Yep. So the workload's increased. And as you get better at your game, you'll be called into different sides and there'll be more workload. So suddenly, overload will become an issue. That is, too much training on your, on your body. All right, you understand the principle of overload? The next thing I look at, from, as a selector, as a person who's picking talent, is something called game sense. Game sense is, I suppose, your ability to read a match. Okay. Often, the best people in the team with this are often the captains, because they naturally become that person. They have good game sense. They can read the, the nature of the game, um, what's happening within the game, how they can change a game. All right. It's maybe an inherent ability in some, or it's learnt over time by playing lots and lots of cricket. Okay, you naturally are able to read different situations within a game simply because you've experienced them before. Would that make sense? Yeah. But some people naturally have this inherent ability that they can read a game from a very young age. Would you say Steve Wall was one of those? Yeah, just a, a, a little bit ahead of the game. Yeah. I think Steve Smith is showing signs of, of being like that. Right? Maybe that'll make him a great captain as he goes on because he has this ability. Like West Australia always seemed to have a person like that. 